Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Good Morning Cannabis. And I have my colleague and friend, Jonathan Havens, from um, the law firm of Saul, not to be confused with Better Call Saul. But Jonathan, I'll let you kind of tell the, the folks listening in a little bit about yourself, about the firm, and we'll get right on to the hot topic of what to expect out of the midterm elections and cannabis. So go for it. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, as you said, I'm Jonathan Havens. I'm with the law firm of Saul Ewing, Ernstein & Lear. I happen to practice out of our Baltimore and Washington, D.C. offices, although we have offices around the country. And I am one of the co-founders and co-chairs of our firm's cannabis law practice. Awesome. So, Jonathan, um, tell us, I mean, what do you see about the emerging cannabis industry through all the various states? What do you think may happen because of the midterm elections? We all want to know since um, we all want to know. Sure. Yeah. So anybody who's been following the cannabis capital markets knows it's been a tough year and everybody is clamoring for some sort of a positive federal policy development. Unfortunately, we haven't seen that. There's been a lot of hope placed on something called the Safe Banking Act. And we've heard rumblings recently um, that the Safe Banking Act has a chance of passing during what's called the lame duck session. That's the period in between the November midterm elections and January when the new Congress is sworn in. So hopefully, fingers crossed, once and for all, Safe Banking Act passes the Senate. Obviously, it's passed the House a number of times. The uh, very sharply divided Senate uh, has been the stumbling block. What we've heard from Majority Leader Schumer is that uh, hopefully it will move during that lame duck session. So we can get into what safe banking does or does not do from a policy perspective. The bottom line, though, is it would signal to the capital markets, to the broader world, that Washington is A-OK -okay with, with cannabis, at least uh, from a banking perspective. And so hopefully that would be a, a shot in the arm, a boost to the cannabis industry from a capital markets perspective. But you know, speaking of the midterm elections, a couple things are, are, are going to happen. Number one, from a state perspective, and states really you know, are where cannabis policy has developed, because I as I just said, there's really been nothing to speak of federally. Uh, there are a number of adult use ballot initiatives, five in fact, that are up for consideration by voters this fall. So, you know, we know that depending on how you define these programs, there are 38 states, believe it or not, that have medical cannabis in one form or fashion and 19 states that have adult use, sometimes referred to as recreational. And there are additional five states that are considering adding adult use uh, come, come this fall. So the landscape, that map, you know, if we, if we had a, a graphic up here, it's a pretty crowded, uh, a crowded map. There are very few holdout states that want nothing to do with cannabis. So I think number one, what we're going to see out of the elections in November is, I would say, at least probably three of these states, if not more, are going to the voters are going to approve adult use cannabis. As you know, cannabis polls very, very well at the ballot box, better yep. than any politician, which yep. begs the question, why aren't politicians supporting it? Uh, again, different conversation for a different day. But I think that's one of the big headlines that's going to come out of this uh, upcoming election, uh, as it did in the last one. You know, weed wins big at the ballot box. That was something that I think may be a headline from Politico during the last election. Um, number two, I think you're going to see a shift in the balance of power in Washington. Obviously, we have the White House occupied by Joe Biden, who's a Democrat. I think that the Republicans take over the House um, pretty easily. Senate's less clear, but you know we have this 50-50 split um, and it makes it very difficult to move anything, let alone cannabis reform. So right. I expect some people think, oh, Republicans, anti-cannabis, Democrats, pro-cannabis. You know, that, that is not true. Uh, sure, I would say the kind of the liberal side of the Democratic Party more apt to support cannabis reform, but if you look at the states that have adopted medical and adult use, some of them are deep red states yeah. and they all recognize, you know, that whether it's tax revenue or medical benefit or whatever it is, whatever causes them to adopt these policies, states are really, really, uh, really chiming in and saying, we want cannabis reform in one form or fashion. So, 
yeah, I think we're going to look at the balance of power shifting. I think we're going to look at adult use expanding. And um, does that place additional pressure on, on Congress to, you know, to finally kind of get in lockstep with the states? It's interesting, Jonathan. I came from a um, conference in Vegas, MJ Unpacked, and one of the speakers was saying, at least from the states that we're really focusing a lot of our attention on, New Jersey and New York, that the prediction is that for New Jersey, um, by 2026, it will be a $2.3 billion industry. And this is all plant touching, not ancillary. And in 2026, it'll be $2.8 in New York. And that's only the beginning. Then New York will be the third largest global market. So I do think that cannabis is here to stay. And it's an industry that will continue to thrive. So wonder if you have any thoughts on, on that. 100%. And you also, you know, you mentioned New Jersey and New York, there's a, a very strong sense of regionalism and regional pressure, right? So you have states that are surrounded by other states that have adult use programs, for example. And what happens if states don't get on board, they lose out on tax revenue, because we know that citizens from one state are apt to drive over a bridge or go through a tunnel or whatever it is to get to another state. And that's tax dollars that a state might be missing out on. So we're seeing this right now. Virginia adopted adult use cannabis, believe it or not, before Maryland. Maryland voters wow. will decide this fall. And now it'll be clear, we actually wrote an article on who's going to launch first and why does it matter? And why it matters is you know, for tax revenue purposes. Uh, it, it matters for a lot of other reasons as well. Job creation, you know, wealth creation, those sorts of things, access uh, to, to patients, uh, inclusion of people who have been adversely impacted by the war on drugs. We've seen that with how New York's been setting up their licensing regime for the adult use market. And so, yeah, it is absolutely here to stay. We hear from clients all the time, especially when we're developing risk factors for public companies. You know, you have to talk about the federal illegality and is this policy going to change? And the answer is it's, it's not going to change. And can you guarantee that? No, you can't guarantee that. But even the federal government, I'm sure you hear people say this all the time. Well, you know, it's not like these businesses are paying taxes. Not only are they paying taxes, they're paying more tax yeah. than proportionally speaking than non-cannabis, non-plant touching businesses. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, it's here to stay. The feds are getting tax revenue. The states are getting tax revenue. It's creating a lot of jobs, a um, lot of infrastructure. And so it is absolutely not going away. So uh, Jonathan, um because I know that we, we try to keep these, these podcasts relatively short. Um, question for you, how did you actually get into the cannabis space? What's your yeah, story? I, I, I describe myself as the accidental cannabis attorney. So I, I grew up in the Washington DC area, kind of grew up around regulatory policy and Congress and agencies. And I, I always thought or figured I would at some point work for a federal agency. I graduated law school during an economic time not dissimilar to right now. This was during the mortgage-backed securities crisis. And I thought, well, you know, this seems like a good time to go work for the government for at least a few years. So I ended up working at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration when they just started regulating tobacco federally. And I thought, you know, this is not exactly what I had planned, but it will make me marketable because no one will have more knowledge than me and my colleagues on how to regulate tobacco since we were actually creating regulation uh, for the first time in that area. So I, I worked at the agency and then I worked at uh, you know, a couple of large law firms uh, in Washington, DC in a food and drug capacity. And then it was in 2015 when Maryland was launching its medical cannabis program, a, a partner who I'd become close with said, hey, do you have any experience with, with uh, medical cannabis you know, regulations? And I said, ah, is that even legal? That was my first response. Yeah, 2015 is a ton, of, a ton of time ago. So in any event, I looked at the set of regs like I do for any other medical device, drug client, food client, and I really kind of had a knack for it. And I also found it very interesting from a you know, medical utility perspective. I got, you know, I just immersed myself in the research, I ended up learning a lot about the regulations. And I was thinking, am I going to go work for this company, for this client? I really liked what they were doing. I decided I wasn't quite ready to make the move. And then I was figuring out what my next professional move was going to be. And I came to Saul Ewing and I said, look, um, you know, I'm a food and drug attorney, but I think this, 
this cannabis thing really has legs and it needs to be a meaningful part of anybody's food and drug practice. And to their credit, they were very supportive from the top on down. You know, there are some law firms out there, some accounting firms that they, they work in the space, but they don't want to be too vocal about it. We've been very much the opposite. And it's helped us grow our practice. And, you know, now we represent public companies, you know, private operators, single state operators as well, but underwriters, family offices, and everyone in between. So it's been a lot of fun. I never really thought when I uh, was a regulatory attorney at the uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration that I'd ever be a cannabis attorney, but but here we are, and I'm you know having a lot of fun doing it. It's cool. So if folks want to find you or reach out to you, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Sure. So uh, like you said at the top, I'm at a firm called Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lear. It's Saul.com. It's very easy to remember if you're a fan of Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul. Yeah. Um, I'm, on, I'm on Twitter as uh, Regulatory, A-T-T-Y, Regulatory Attorney. Uh, LinkedIn, just first name, Jonathan, last name, Havens. And uh, yeah, I am you know speak at a lot of conferences, attend a lot of industry events like you do. So hopefully I'll see everyone out and about. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, thank you for coming on the show today. And um, have a great day, my friend. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me. Thanks.